From today onwards, we will then begin the study of Uttara Tantra Shastra. This particular text, during studying of this, I think we are quite fortunate to have such an opportunity to encounter the Mahayana Sutra, the Mahayana teachings, especially the teachings that passed down from Maitreya Buddha, from a Maitreya Bodhisattva. And I think this teaching will bring great benefits to all of us in terms of our practice. Even if you don't understand the most profound aspect of this teaching, as long as you have faith, have a joyful mind, and receiving the oral transmissions of this particular teaching, then the blessings and merits are immeasurable. Therefore, I think let it be a practitioner, maybe a, a practitioner who are looking for gaining merits through studying so that you can then eliminate lots of defilements. And another group of you who are in this audience are scholars. This particular text is a quite important text in the West as well as the East, because this is the text that talks about the Tathagarbha, the Buddha nature. So, during the teaching of this text, I plan to teach it through both aspects from practitioners' aspects as well as the academic aspects. And uh, we're going to teach mainly on the, uh, on the stanzas, but also we're going to use the commentary from the Taranata. We are using Taranata's explanation on this Shastra to, um, to study, and I'm going to use it as an outline to teach. I mostly will use it as a, an, as a reference. First of all, I would like to talk about the merits of studying this Uttara Tantra Shastra, which was introduced to you earlier in the earlier classes as well. It says in the text saying that mostly people use practicing compassion to uh, make offering with the generosity uphold precepts and using such ways to accumulate merits. In fact, if you can listen to this teaching with respect, then the merit of which is much greater. It is stated in the chapter 5, the benefit chapter, uh, in the stanza, uh, within this book, in the text, it says that on the Chinese version, on the 
page 331, it says that someone striving for enlightenment may turn to the Dharma kings, offering golden fields adorned with gems of equal number to the atoms in the Buddha fields, and may continue doing so every day. Another may just hear a word of this, and upon hearing it, becoming filled with devotion. He will attain merits far greater and more manifold than the virtues sprung from this practice of giving. The merit of making such great offering of gold fields adorned with gems, and you do it every day, is still less than the merit of listening to the teaching of Uttara Tantra and uh, generate great faith in it. Now let's contemplate up, uh, on ourselves. We don't have enough gold and gems to adorn those lands and uh, then make offering to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. We ha sometimes have flowers and have fruit uh, and uh, make such kind of offerings. So we have a stinginess about those. Uh, but upon hearing the word, a word of Uddhara Tantra Shastra, you will attain merits far greater than making such a uh, great um, offering. An intelligent person wishing for enlightenment may be body, speech, and mind, guard a flawless moral conduct and do so effortlessly, even through many eons. Another may just hear a word of this, and upon hearing it, it becomes fulfilled with devotion. He will then attain merits far greater than and more manifold than the virtue sprung from this discipline. So upholding the perfect precept for eons and eons, such kind of merit is still less than the merit than up hearing, up, uh, on, up on hearing a word from Uttara Tantra Shastra and generate faith in it. Also, someone here may finally achieve the divine meditative stability and Brahma's abode, thus quenching all afflictions fire within the three realms of existence, and may cultivate these as a means to reach unchanging and perfect enlightenment. Another may just hear a word of this, and upon hearing it, it become and upon hearing it become filled with devotion, he will attain merits far greater and more manifold than virtues sprung from this meditation. Therefore, before the teaching of this Uttara Tantra Shastra, I really hope that you can generate great faith and devotion in this text because it talks quite a bit about why and uh, uh, the reason behind the Buddha nature. Of course, for those of you who don't have any faith, if you don't recognize the Buddha's words as true and the Maitreya Bodhisattva's words as true, then of course I can't do much about it. But from my perspective, from a Buddhist perspective, I really think this opportunity of studying this Uttar, uh, this uh, Uttara Tantra Shastra is, uh, in fact, uh, quite incredible. For those of you who are attending classes over here, I think that we should have the after-class dis discussion group. But for those of you who are not in the discussion group, let you be the divine beings who live up or the beings who live underneath or so on. I really hope that you could have a glimpse of the teachings of, of uh, Buddha nature. When we try to understand the Buddhism, when we try to study Buddhism, 
I think at first we talk about the truth of suffering, truth of uh, the um, uh, the compounded uh, the accumulation of suffering, and then the truth of cessation of suffering and the path of cessation. And then in the second turning, we talk about uh, bodhicitta and compassion, and in the third in the also, in the Prajna Paramita, we talk about how all the phenomena are empty. It is then devoid of all fabrications and all extremes. In the third turning of the Dharma wheel, the Buddha then taught how the sentient beings has, has a luminous, luminosity. And the seed of such luminosity is there. If you say that there is nothing in sentient beings, then how could they attain Buddhahood? So it is not just the extreme of a nihilistic view of uh, the emptiness. In the Prajna Paramita, we talk about how form is emptiness and emptiness is form. The form is emptiness that is taught in the second turning of the Dharma wheel. And in the, sec in the third turning of the Dharma wheel, we talk about the emptiness is form, because emptiness that we are talking about is not just nihilistic emptiness or voidness. This kind of teaching is included in the, uh, in the tantras in the, in the tantras, we talk about the form is no other than emptiness, and emptiness is no other than form. And then at the, there's a story where you talk about how at the beginning we see mountains as mountains and waters as water, and in the middle you see that the mountains are no longer mountains and water is no longer water, but at the end you see mountains as mountains and water as water again, and so it has quite profound meanings in it. Some Buddhists, when they are studying emptiness, uh, the text on emptiness, such as the 400 stanzas on emptiness uh, of Madhyamika and so on. They will then understand how emptiness works. But today we're going to talk about from the other aspect about how the Buddha nature is no increasing or no decreasing. There is no birth and no death of such Buddha nature. So everything in within this uh, nature is uh, uh, devoid of all kinds of uh, grasping. So in this study of this particular teaching, I really hope that all of you could give rise to a greater devotion, of course. There are people who would wonder why, why could uh, people get enlightened if we don't have the Buddha nature, then how can we attain Buddhahood? If, if there is no cause and no condition for Buddhahood to arise, and how, how could that be possible? That is a flawed. Uh, it uh, wouldn't go through any inferences. It has many faults that could attach to, to such statement. Therefore, today we're, I'm going to then share this Uttara Tantra Shastra with all of you. As I just stated earlier, during the teaching of this time, I think we should uh, refer back to the Taranatha's explanation on this Uttara Tantra. I think this text, in fact, brings, has lots of uh, special connections to all of us. Back in around 15 years back, Pansu Rinpoche passed uh, into Paranirvana after only teaching for nine years. At that time, I was uh, also, sem uh, also doing simultaneous translation for him at that time. 
He taught Mipa Rinpoche's commentary on this uh, Wudhara Tantra Shastra. And then around time that he, around that time uh, when it was almost at the uh, Sukhavati Dharma uh, Assembly, then uh, the sister of Ponsu Rinpoche passed away. And then after nine classes of teaching this particular Shastra, Ponsu Rinpoche then passed away as well. At first, he gave lots of teachings from Mipa Rinpoche. Mostly he followed the explanation and the Shastra's teaching. He basically followed the teaching and without much of uh, uh, much of uh, his own explanation. So I listened to part of the recording from then in this morning. And uh, I will point out to where he stopped in this lifetime when we get there as well. I myself, I really wanted to teach this particular Shastra, but I didn't have such an, an opportunity to do so until, to, until this year. I've then translated this as well as the, the Taranata's uh, explanation into Chinese. There are many explain, uh, there are many uh, commentaries on this particular sh uh, shastra. Ponsu Rinpoche and many masters attach great importance onto this shastra. Of course, there are many other different translations and editions that's available, including in the Tibetan text, Tibetan version, uh, the Gatsabji, he wrote a commentary. As well as Guru uh, Tawa, who was the uh, the author of uh, the Blue Anel also made a commentary on this particular Shastra. The, his uh, commentary is a rather extensive commentary that has two big volumes. There's a short commentary also. In front of uh, Kempo uh, Noro around 1985, that was the first time I listened to this Shastra. Uh, around that summer, Ponsok Rinpoche took a few people to, uh, to Nyaro, and uh, then in, the, in Larongar, we had a few classes, only about 40 to 50 people. Around that time, Kempo uh, Gardo was teaching the the uh, Bodhicharya Avatara and uh, Kempo Noro was teaching us uh, the Uttara Tantra Shastra. I was really happy because that was the time that was a time that uh, I first listened to this Shastra and uh, I was quite diligent at that time. Also, it was the first time that I get to know what Buddha nature was. That, um, I was studying in the Buddha nature for the first time. Now, when I think about it, I can still remember all the scenes of studying the Uttara Tantra Shastra. There was not many houses in Larangar at that time, only about 40 to 50. There were a lot of poisonous snakes and lots of marmots around. When it's sunny, 
We would sit in the uh, we would sit uh, outside and uh, on the grass and listen to the teachings of uh, Uttara Tantra Shastra. And sometimes the marmots would come to us and uh, uh, would ask for food from us, and we would feed them with some leaves and grass and so on. Sometimes a kempo, sometimes a kempo would complain, "Would you please do not do that uh, during class? Can you do that after class?" He's, he's, he has really great temper. Unlike me, when I see people who are not uh, attentive during the class, I can't handle it. But <laughs> he is not like that. He's he's very mild in temper. Uh, even if we even if uh, we argue and debate during class really loudly, he would say that, could you please lower your voice? He has, he's uh, very mild in temper. So that was uh, the one that I studied during uh, the year 1985. There are many other texts and uh, commentaries from different schools and different uh, uh, from different masters as well. Lots of reference as well. But why I chose Taranata's commentary as a reference this time, it is because, first of all, Ponsugur Rinpoche, when he was alive, he attached great importance of this particular commentary. When I translated, there were, when I uh, translated many texts, I translated from different schools, the Galupa, Kagyupa, Nyingmapa, uh, Sakyapa, but not very much from the Jonam school. But since I had the aspiration of translating all different schools of commentaries and teachings, and therefore I chose this one. Also, the Jonam school nowadays is not as well spread on this uh, Tibetan plateau, but when it just started, it was very popular, it was uh, uh, quite prosperous back then. In fact, the teaching of Jonampa teach much about the, uh, from the aspect of other emptiness or teach from the Buddha nature aspect, or from the uh, Sutrayana aspect. And from Tantrayana aspect, they, uh, they teach lots of pith instructions from the Kala Chakras, uh, the Kala Chakras teaching and uh, the six, uh, six kinds of preliminary practices. On top of that, this Master Taranata, he started practicing uh, around 17 years old, uh, 17 years of age, and uh, he seemed to have great ability to communicate with uh, different uh, bodhisattvas, just like human beings to human beings. He also taught at uh, Sakya school. At that time, during the time he was teaching at a Sakya school, they, uh, at that time, the Sakya school did not allow them to uh, teach anything but the Sakya school teaching. Uh, but since Taranata then went overboard and started teaching others, uh, he was expelled from that school. Lots of great masters from Tibet, they all been expelled, such as Long Chenpa and so on. Uh, he also composed uh, many other commentaries. After 100 years, Taranata then was born. He was the uncle of uh, the fifth Dalai Lama. He also was considered as a reincarnation of uh, Long Chumpa. I think it was included in the autobiography, uh, in the biography. During that period of time, the teaching of Jonampa was rather quite uh, prosperous. 
Postal members who then later why Zhou Nanpa was not included in the four great schools of uh, Tibetan Buddhism. The Sutrayana teachings taught, also had, all had their own system of studying the five, uh, the five great treatises, but uh, in Zhou Nanpa, they don't really have such a complete system of studying the five great treatises. They, their most emphasis was on the uh, Buddhist logics. So it may be of that reason it is not that popular at this time, but it is quite important to uh, then again revive the teachings of uh, Zhou Nampa. <coughs> That is why this time I chose to teach from the commentary of uh, uh, the commentary of uh, Taranata from the Jonang School. Also, I was uh, requested from lots of the Jonangpa masters. They've requested me many times, and many masters requested me many times. Uh, therefore, as a, such an auspicious uh, request, then I translated Taranata's commentary. Also, it is part of my promise, so now I'm fulfilling my promise. Today, this teaching is, this text is one of the five Maitreya's uh, treatises. What are the five treatises? According to the Tibetan, uh, uh, Tibetan history uh, and uh, on the Tibetan plateau, we all then all agree that those are the five treatises that's uh, composed by by uh, Maitreya Bodhisattva and after Asanga who practiced in uh, the uh, mountains and then he after attaining uh, some realization uh, but it couldn't really ha he couldn't uh, feel any kind of insights uh, that could arise from his uh, uh, practice and then at that time he decided to go down after six years halfway through he met a person who was trying to uh, trying to make a an iron rod into a thin needle he thought to himself well if a person if a worldly person would have been such diligence into uh, such boring things, why would I give up my practice that is really valuable? So he went back to his cave, and uh, he went back to his practicing cave again and continued to practice for another three years. But after three years, uh, he felt that there was no insight, no auspicious dream, and no, uh, not any sign of realization at all. Then he uh, went down again. He uh, saw a person who was trying to sweep the mountain away with a feather. He thought to himself, uh, well, then if a person, a worldly person is uh, so very diligent in doing such a, a, a non-valuable thing, why wouldn't I continue to engage in my practice again? Uh, well, sometimes uh, when I go to the school that I founded, I saw this mountain that's right in front of uh, the, the school, and uh, it blocks the sunlight, especially in the winter. It's very cold. So I would think to myself, why wouldn't, why shouldn't I then uh, sweep the mountain away with a feather. Then. That's how I felt at that time. I remember this story. Every time I go to their, the school, I feel that was I, I felt that uh, was uh, the the uh, the inspiration for me to remember that story because the sunlight uh, really was blocked by the mountains over there. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, uh, Asanga then at that time thought to himself, "Well, then I should engage in something that's more valuable." And then he he came back and uh, then practice for another three years without any insights or any uh, any signs of realization. 
Uh, so he's practiced uh, over there for uh, 12 years in total. And then uh, he left to the cave and he felt that uh, there's no way that he can attain any realization at all. But on the way, uh, he saw this uh, dog which was uh, rotten from waist down and was very much hurt. And uh, lots of maggots was crawling on that dog. He gave rouse to great compassion. And then at that time, he uh, he knelt down in front of the dog and then tried to use his tongue to pick up the maggots because he doesn't want to use the hand or anything else to hurt the maggots either. Uh, at that time, uh, when he closed his eyes, he was trying to uh, use his tongue to get the maggots out. He then opened his eyes and he saw the Buddha, uh, Buddha Maitreya was in front of him. Uh, saw, saw Maitreya Bodhisattva in front of him. Then Maitreya Bodhisattva uh, appeared in front of him. Um, Asanga was rather feeling upset at that moment, saying that I've been practicing for 12 years and you didn't give me any sign, and you, not even a good dream. And then uh, uh, Maitreya Bodhisattva said that, well, I've never really departed from you, but it is because that you never really gave rouse to the genuine compassion, therefore you could Ne you could never see me. It is only that after seeing the uh, the dog, uh, you give rouse to great compassion. That's how you can see me. Uh, if you don't believe me, why don't you carry me on your shoulder and uh, walk around in the bazaar, in the market, and then see if people could see see me or not? So he did so and walked around in the markets, uh, and uh, indeed no one could uh, see Maitreya Bodhisattva except there was one old woman who uh, had rather a bit more compassion, and uh, she saw a dead dog. Uh, corpse on the uh, on the shoulder of uh, Sangha, and then. Uh, he, and then Asanga was brought into uh, the celestial realm by Maitreya Bodhisattva, and that's where he then uh, heard and studied the five treatises of uh, Maitreya. That's how it is uh, well known in Tibet. But in the Han tradition, it is said that According to uh, Dun Lun from Tang Dynasty, he then uh, wrote a commentary on the Yoga Yogacharya uh, Shastra. And in that Shastra, he says that Maitreya Buddha then, instead of bringing Asanga along to the celestial realm, he actually descended from the celestial realm to Asanga and then taught Asanga the five treatises, which included the um, great the ornament of Mahayana Sutra, the distinguishing middle from, uh, from extremes and uh, uh, distinguishing the yoga uh, Yogacara Shastra and uh, uh, Vajra Prajna Paramita Shastra and uh, the um, as well as the distinguishing Dharma and Dharmata. So the teachings are a bit different than the ones that's included in the Tibetan tradition. Uh, <coughs> Five treatises of 
the five treatises of uh, uh, Maitreya. Well, today we do have a little more uh, people showing up listening to this class, but maybe tomorrow, I'm not quite sure you will attend or not. If you're studying, it, it is best to listen to the whole thing from the beginning to the end. Otherwise, I know there are a lot of people who attend the first and then the last class, nothing in the middle. That's not really good. I see that uh, there are uh, people who are attending. There are people who are attending the uh, after class discussion group. At the beginning, there were more people in the middle, not as many, and the last day was not that much. It is quite important to, to be persistent. Maybe at the beginning you feel quite inspired to listen to the Uttara Tantra Shastra by the Maitreya, and then you lose interest halfway and don't want to continue with it anymore. I, I don't think that's very good. I see some Sangha members persist all the way through for years and decades. They would not miss out any class, especially uh, people from uh, different countries. I know that uh, because of the different time, the different time zone, there are people who had to attend the class during commute time, during meal time, during work even. But uh, I really appreciate that you persist all the way through. Because when you look back at your life, this is quite valuable that you, you've you studied great sutras and shastras. Whichever kampo or kemal give teaching to uh, the class, I know there are people who have great joy to listen to the Dharma. And I think you know if you really listened and persisted all the way through the classes, you will gain great benefits. Of course, I'm not selling this class like a merchant who is selling a fortified product because a fortified product would appear to be genuine and good at first, but there's no value to it. But this is this kind of teaching is not like that at all. After listening to such teachings, you will gain great benefits at the beginning, the middle, and at the end. Uh, today, for those of you uh, who are attending this class, and especially after listening to the merits of uh, the, the uh, and especially for those of you whomsoever wanting to gain merits through listening to such great teaching, you might be quite uh, disappointed because today we're not going to give any teaching about those uh, uh, about those uh, verses at all. Around, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history. So it, is, it was translated into Chinese back in the 6th century. The person who translated this from the Sanskrit version to Chinese version, his name is uh, Ratna Maitri. But during his translation, he did not remark who was the author of this Uttara Tantra Shastra. I think around maybe 90s, during the 90s, I uh, bought the text, the Chinese text of uh, this translation. But um, when I compared it with uh, the Tibetan version, I found that it was it has lots of differences. So the mainland received the teaching of the Buddha nature in a rally, rather early period of time. Then in the 7th century, one of the patri patriarchs of the Tiantai school, uh, Master Fa Zhang, he then translated this 
呃，论论的这个讲述当中呢，就是说是。He he then taught on the uh Wutai Tantra Shastra. And uh, in that teaching, he said that it was then written by Master Jianhui. And because of that, uh, included in the Japanese Tripitaka, the author's name is written as Master Jianhui. Or um. I think that view is rather popular. In the Korean version of Tribitaka, it also is translated. It's also included in the Korean version of Tribitaka. Maybe translator in the 60s, in the 1960s. In fact, the Wutai Tantra Shastra was considered as the product, a written product, or that is composed by Master Zhenghui. Majority of people from um, this school would consider that around the 10th century, Marpa Lotawa's teacher, his name is Matripa. Some history says that states that he was the one who then found the five treaties, treatises, and uh, uh, some others say that he was the one who they rediscovered the distinguishing the middle from the extreme. It was then translated into Tibetan. And the teaching of the teaching of uh, uh, Uttara Tantra Shastra was then uh, taught and propagated on the Tibetan plateau. But in Tibet, we all consider that this particular text is composed by Maitreya Bodhisattva, and there is no argument about it at all. And the Uttara Tantra Shastra, just like Bodhicharya Avatara, it is a text that is widely taught by all schools, and there are many different commentaries on it. Also, many masters consider that uh, this text has such great profound Meanings within, and uh, uh, in order to hearing to hear this teaching, you have to have uh, empowerment first. Uh, the title of it is Uttara Tantra, which means uh, the Tantra that is unsurpassable. So it is not just a. So it is not just any kind of normal or uh, or ordinary teaching. Rather, it is a tantra. And this is taught by Maitreya Bodhisattva. The four of his five treatises are considered as. Uh, Sutrayana teachings, and uh, this one is considered as a Madhuryana teaching. So Maitreya Buddha, Bodhisattva, or then the Master Jianhui's translation. In fact, there are quite a bit of controversial about it. Because 
The translation from mainland is, does not have the uh, author's name included. In fact, Rana, Mai, Rana Mati is a great uh, translator. He translated many different texts, including the uh, Tenbumi Sutra. So the majority of the majority of the opinion is that the Master Jianhui actually translated this text, but during the 1930s, 1931, uh, Russian a Russian translator, he translated this text from Tibetan to English. His name is Obermiller. Around 1935, an Indian scholar, his name is Rahula, and he discovered the Sanskrit version of Uttara Tantra Shastra. That's the first time of discovering the Sanskrit version from India, uh, from, uh, the, uh, East, from East Asia, uh, from, from the Middle East Asia area. After comparing it, the Sanskrit version and Tibetan version is very similar. And later on, there was a, there was a scholar, his name is Justin, from Oxford University. He's quite great. He knows many languages. He stayed in India for many years. He knows Sanskrit, Tibetan, and Chinese. And then, of course, English, because he's studying in Oxford University. So he knows the four languages. Then he compared the Tibetan, Sanskrit, and Chinese version. There was not much of a difference. I think he passed away around 1942, but he then made comparisons and uh, 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 so the book that I was just showing on the screen, that was the first text that's published in English and with a comparison with Sanskrit. This is quite important development. And on the title, it says that it is the Uttara Tantra Shastra by Maitreya. Similarly, it is stated in Sanskrit version, and the Tibetan version and Sanskrit version are very much uh, fitting with, e with each other. There was not much of a difference. And ever since then, many scholars from the West, they all consider that the Uttara Tantra Shastra as a text that's composed by Maitreya Bodhisattva. Maybe before that, there were still controversies. But for the West, ever since the publishing of this book, that is published back in 1950, 
and then the West started to, uh, then the West started to then research and study uh, Buddha nature, the philosophy of Buddha nature. In on Tibetan plateau, we talk about Buddha nature very much. And around the 6th century, the mainland started talking about, talking about Buddha nature uh, in Tibet. It's from 10th century. And, uh, from, and in the West, it is from the 20th century, rather, uh, maybe beginning from the end of 19th century and the early of 20th century. That's the beginning of, the beginning of uh, studying uh, Buddha nature, thinking of Buddha nature. In the mainland, we talk about the four stanzas. The first two are uh, there was a, this one, one uh, four sentence stanza that the uh, first one says that do not, uh, do not do any evil and uh, conduct all good. And then talk about the Prajnamita. The teaching from uh, Tibetan Buddhism, especially on the Buddha nature aspect, is very different than what the Westerners would consider uh, as a norm, which is the origin sin. So after such a long period of time of immersed in the philosophy of origin uh, of the original thing, uh, when the teaching of Buddha nature started to spread in the West, I think many scholars and many people were quite excited about this idea that uh, the purity of, uh, of uh, all sentient beings' nature so when you are studying the Buddha nature, I really hope that you could then uh, take reference from the third attorney of wheel, such as uh, the praise of uh, the Dhammadattu and uh, relevant uh, commentaries to this Uttara Tantra Shastra and uh, study and uh, compare and do research. Because in Buddhism, sometimes we talk about emptiness, sometimes we talk about uh, not empty, sometimes we talk about uh, self empty. Sometimes we talk about uh, other empty. And uh, how do you distinguish? How do you then make a choice? Uh, so I think in order to understand all of these different terms and different uh, aspects of emptiness, it is quite important to continue to study. And after studying, your doubts will be easily to be, to be dispelled. What I think is that in this in this world, it's quite important to know the history background. I know that in Japan, that nowadays there are uh, editions that is translated from Tibetan to Japanese, and from uh, Sanskrit to Japanese, and from Chinese to Japanese. I think that lots of scholars do attach great importance to this text. That's why there are so many editions. And I think they've spent lots of effort and time uh, to dig the profundity of, of Uttara Tantra Shastra. <coughs> Similarly, in Europe, there are studies of this text as well. Uh, some French scholars uh, studied this text as well. I think after studying this text, you will then develop a firm belief that everyone do have 
Buddha nature do have the inherent Buddha nature. In the, in the Mahaparinibbana Sutra, it says that to describe the tenth Bhumi Bodhisattva's uh, appearance, it is just like to watch the stars in the uh, in the night at night. So we need to then study. This text, in order to understand the profound, the subtle, and uh, the all inherent nature of uh, Buddha nature of all sentient beings. So I think that uh, we uh, should. That's why we should then study this uh, text. From different countries, different ethnic, different language areas, if we can then uh, make analysis and study and research, this is quite important. There are teachers and scholars who would consider that a, a Maitreya Bodhisattva is a person, who is a historical person who, uh, is, who really existed, uh, who then met a Sangha and he was, uh, he was a real person around the same time with a Sangha. So I think people without a background of faith, when they get into the arena of uh, religion, then it is very difficult for them to dig in because they cannot really get into the, the profundity of a religion without faith. People nowadays, they would uh, only see materialistic appearances as a materialistic appearances. They would say, for example, some historical event during Tochun, the Tetsan and uh, so on. The Russian scholars and the Indian scholars, the, the British scholars, they're, they're really great. Sometimes I would consider to, uh, I would ponder up on uh, the historical context, up on, uh, up on the historical context myself. During the 1950s, 40s and 50s, that was during the time of the Second World War. Even during such turbulent time, the scholars still invested all their time into, into research and into study. That is quite rare. During such a chaotic and uh, uh, during such a chaotic and uh, turbulent world, if they can really dedicate their effort into study, I think that's such a great aspiration and such a great effort they, they've made. Many scholars were quite great. They were both scientists and scholars and academics and uh, uh, philosophers. I'm not sure if in our modern time, in the 21st century, we still have such devoted academias. Uh, the, uh, even the, the, the people who made lots of travel logs and uh, uh, invested lots of time. In fact, I think it's, it was quite rare I mean, from the last century during such a special time, a period of time, they were still able to invest a lot of their energy and time solely into the study and the research. So during the time of uh, the 18th and 19th century, during the, the World War I, World War II, that was such a bloody time. Uh, it was so violent, but many great people really thrived from that time. Not only thrived, they uh, 
Daddy, they made a great transformation in terms of their scholarly research. Maitreya Bodhisattva. Okay, so we'll stop here today. <coughs> Tomorrow we'll continue with this class. <laughs>